everybody, I'm Chris, and this is Ready to Die Fighting. Um, if you live on planet Earth, then you have probably heard that um, in Michigan, where I live, uh, in the metro Detroit area, where I live, we had a school shooting um, pretty recently. And this particular shooting, uh, I mean, they're all bad. Uh, I don't know that this one is any worse than any other, but this one is getting a lot of attention for a few different reasons. Um, it seems to be what everyone's talking about, certainly here, but as best I can tell, it seems to even made international news and across the country. Uh, this one's getting a lot of attention. I mean, I think they all do, but um, whatever. And I'm not going to really go into detail of this particular shooting because there's already an abundance of information about that. You know, you can research it if you haven't heard about it at all, but, um, you know, that's not what this video is about. I really want to talk about something that I haven't seen talked about as much in uh, the news. Even locally, I haven't seen a whole lot of talk. And that's the aftermath of this shooting. So I don't know if the people outside of the area know this, but since that happened, there have been multiple threats. Um, just today, I saw, I got a notification that one of the high schools, uh, really not too far from me, shut down because there was a, a, a gun threat. Uh, um, I don't, yeah, I guess like a threat of bringing a gun and shooting the place up. Um, I think it was maybe two days ago, a different school, there was reports of shot fired, shots fired. The police actually responded. It turned out to be a false alarm, but, uh, you know, you got to take this stuff seriously. And I'm not exactly sure how you got a false alarm people, but in any case, that's what happened last week. Almost, almost every school in the area, just tons of schools all closed down because there were multiple threats. Seven kids, the last I checked, um, are in jail right now. Ages, I want to say the youngest was 12, you know, going up to maybe 14 or 15. Um, aside from the kid who made the big news for threatening to bring a gun to school. One of them actually did bring a gun to school and he, they somehow caught him before he was able to do anything with it. Um, on an even more personal level, a boy in Nate's school said he was going to bring in a gun and he was going to shoot two kids in particular. Um, Nate was right there. He heard it. He knows this boy. This boy is actually a kid who's been bullying him for the last month and a half. Um, Nate was not one of the people that this boy named that he was going to target. But he knows the kids that, that weren't. So this is hitting really close to home. This is something that whether we want to or not, we can't just say it'll never happen to me or turn a blind eye or whatever. Like this is, this is happening all around us and we have to deal with it. Um, so in Nate's case, this particular boy, he's, I talked to the principal shortly after it happened. Uh, this was on uh, maybe four days ago. And um, at the time, the boy was temporarily suspended. He's not in jail, as at least as of the time that I talked to her, because he has an IEP and he is cognitively impaired. It's a individual education plan, I believe is what it's, the abbreviation is. And so... I mean, IEPs come, you have different levels of needs and care and, and all that. Um, so this particular kid, he is, he's on the, he's, a, he needs a higher level of, um, accommodation and care. So it is a very legitimate question of whether he actually understood what he was saying or if he was just kind of parroting things that he's heard other kids say and just kind of what the narrative is right now and not really fully understanding what he's saying and the consequences of it and all that. 
So they have to investigate, find out what he's actually mentally capable of and what his intentions were before they decide how to proceed. Whether that means he ends up in jail, if he's expelled, if he um, is, just has to have closer supervision, and you know, they check his backpack every day before he comes to school, you know, all that type of stuff. And I believe that's the right approach. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that because um, in this particular case, you know, he, he is a kid and he's, he is not neurotypical. Um, it's the best way I could think of to put it. All that being said, regardless of where he is mentally and emotionally, what his capabilities are, even if he has even if he has access to a gun, this is still something that happened. This is something that Nate saw and heard and felt. It's a very real threat. And regardless of what happens to that particular boy, we still have to deal with this. We still have to react to this. And it's very frustrating because I don't think this is going away. Um, I, in years past, you know, at some point, I can't remember the exact, but um, I, one day I looked at, you know, why are all these school shootings happening? When did this start? And I just did a really quick basic Google search, probably looking at Wikipedia or something like that, just kind of looking at statistics of school shootings. And it is something that realistically started with my generation. Columbine wasn't the first time that uh, people brought weapons to school and shot up the place, but I believe it was the first where it was more of a... Um, random act. I shouldn't even say random. Um, people have brought schools, sh guns to school. You know I mean? There's certainly in Detroit, you know, there's gang related activities and things like that happen. That's more targeted. I'm going to bring my gun. And I'm going to shoot that guy. You know, that's something that could happen. Uh, there was, I think it was in the seventies. A man came up to a school. His girlfriend or wife was a teacher there. He came in and he sh shot her. I don't know if she was cheating on him or if it was, domestic abuse or I don't know the scenario. I don't know if they went into detail. I believe maybe some children were hit in like a, in the, uh, accidentally, but he was targeting a specific person. These school shootings that we're seeing post Columbine, um, are more just, I'm going to go in and I'm going to shoot as many people as I can. And pretty just kind of going for points, not even necessarily targeting specific people. Maybe they do target their bullies, perhaps, but they're trying to get anyone they can in the process. And so that is different. That's unique to the last 20, 30 years. And no one really seems to know why. We're quick to blame the bullies. We're quick to blame guns. But guns have existed in the United States for a very long time. And they've been in people's homes for a very long time. We are a very gun-friendly friendly country and always has been. Probably always will be. Guns are not new. Bullies are not new. If you go, Bullies have existed since humans existed. If you go back to biblical times, you know, with Cain and Abel, with Noah, we, we, we saw examples of bullying and teasing and, you know, people just being jerks to each other and even killing each other and all that. None of this is new. This type of violence, though, is. And I don't see anyone talking about the real reasons why it's happening or doing any real research to figure out why it's happening. We just want to react and say, bellies, guns, and not address the actual problem. I'm not saying I know what the actual problem is. I have some ideas, but I don't actually know. And because no one knows, it's not going to go away. We're not going to be able to fix it. So what do we do? We have to do something. As individuals, I can't just sit here and turn a blind eye and hope for the best. That's, that's not acceptable to me. I think the most important thing to do, I think, I think it was four. four. We'll see. I, I think I had four in mind. I don't remember the number. But I think the first most important thing for us as individuals is to work on our own mental health. This is a really scary situation. I've never gone to school 
and worried about if someone was going to shoot me or not. That is not a thing that ever crossed my mind. I might have worried if somebody's going to shoot me in other places, but not at school, not at 12 or 13 years old. That's not a thing I ever had to experience. I've never had anyone, you know, die of a pandemic around me. There's a lot of stuff, I mean, you know, as a child. Actually, I haven't yet as an adult either. Other people have, but the fear of it is here. The fear of it was never there as a child. There's a lot of stuff that Nate has to deal with that I never had to. And there's a lot of stuff that Nate has to deal with that every kid has to. You know, puberty's tough, bullies are tough, school is tough, figuring out what you're going to be when you grow up, that's all tough. But there's a lot. And so the extra that we didn't have when we were kids. And so he has to have the space to process those feelings and to understand those feelings. And that's where I think therapy really comes in. You know, there's such a stigma against therapy and I don't think it's fair. Your brain is just an organ. It's an organ just like your liver, your kidneys, your lungs, your heart. And everybody takes those organs seriously. You take care of them. You do preventative maintenance. If somebody says something's wrong with your heart, you know, you'll do a low cholesterol diet. You'll cut sodium. You do some cardio. Drink water. Take your vitamins. Stop eating trans fats. You know, all this stuff that we are told to do either preventatively or as a remedy to our various other organs having issues. We respect those organs. Those organs can fail. They can become hurt and they can cause problems. We acknowledge that. We know that. We do not treat our brains the same way and I don't know why. It's just an organ. It has needs just like the rest of our body. It needs maintenance. There are certain things that you can do to make it stronger or weaker, sicker and better and the way that its symptoms present, instead of having high blood sugar or high, uh, uh, what do you call it, blood pressure, or maybe developing kidney stones, is that you can start to suffer mentally and it can affect your behavior, it can affect your attitude, your, your mental health, the way you respond to the world. And it's not just your brain, there's also hormones and chemicals that are in your body and those are harder to understand, but they are very real and they need to be maintained and monitored and there's things that you can do to keep all this stuff regulated so that you can be balanced and function as society without flying off the handles and shooting people up because they called you ugly. And that's where therapy comes in. We need to take mental health seriously. There's such a stigma, especially in, I think, like the black community. I've heard so many times, you don't need therapy, you need Jesus. <sighs> sure, if you believe that, but you wouldn't say that if somebody had high cholesterol. You don't need a doctor, you need Jesus. That's how ridiculous it is. <laughs> I mean, therapy, it's not a miracle that you know you just automatically cure stuff but what it does is help you recognize your feelings put names to your feelings understand what those feelings mean and different ways they can present it can help you find your triggers and the patterns that you fall into um, and help you figure out healthy coping mechanisms healthy ways to process and handle these feelings so that you can stay under control you can also have some people do meet, need medication for various reasons. I am one of those people. I suffer from depression, pretty severe depression. Um, it's been bad for a long time. It got really, really bad once my mom died. And that's something I'm still struggling with. In a long time, for a long time, I did not recognize it as depression. Because for me and for many people, not all, but for many, it presented as anger. I felt mad all the time. I was just constantly pissed off to the point where I just always was like on the edge of just completely snapping. And it took almost all of my self-control to keep from losing my temperature, or temperature, temper, 
I feel like the Incredible Hulk just waiting to just oh, explode and smash things all the time. And, but it, I didn't have the anger problem. I was depressed. And so because I didn't understand what I was feeling, I didn't get the help I needed. I didn't get on antidepressants until, I mean, it was, it was way too long. I should have, I should have gotten help way sooner. And since talking to a therapist, since getting on antidepressants, it's so weird the anger has gone away. <laughs> Not a hundred percent, you know, I'm still generally, my baseline is I'm kind of a, just an angry little person. But it's nowhere near, nowhere near what it used to be. I can actually have good days. I can actually smile and be happy. I can actually, something bad can happen and I don't want to break things. Don't want to Christmas. And that's important. It's important because if we are to believe that bullies are the reason that kids go and shoot up a school, then yeah, part of the problem is we need to teach kids not to bully, but we also need to teach kids how to handle bullying because bullying also isn't gonna go away. And even if you could somehow get rid of all bullying, there's still gonna be conflicts. There's still gonna be people you don't like. There's still gonna be misunderstandings and things that you can interpret as an insult or um, as some sort of bullying and the person may have no bad intentions whatsoever. It's just a misunderstanding. All that stuff happens and you have to be stable enough to be able to think through that and respond in a healthy way. Something we talk about a lot uh, with Nate, <coughs> not just Nate, but myself as well, um, is that there are no bad feelings. Human beings, we feel all of the feelings, all of us, at different times. And they're completely appropriate at the right time. Where they become bad is how you react to those feelings. Being angry in and of itself is not bad. This is something that me and Nate have talked about a lot. Being angry, being mad, being frustrated, that's fine. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes change, or sorry, anger is required for change. Sometimes. Sometimes that's the only way things will change. Politically, uh, culturally, you know, maybe within yourself, maybe with your partner, whatever. You have to get mad before change happens. It's how you handle that anger. If you get mad and sign some petitions or write letters to your politician or you decide, you know, I'm angry at this, I'm going to do better job myself, whatever, that's good. That's righteous anger and you're using that anger to fuel change. Good job. If you use that anger to go buy a gun and shoot up a school, that's bad. It's the same feeling. Anger is anger. It's how you respond to it. It's how you handle it that makes a difference. And that's something that we talk about a lot in therapy. Identifying the feeling and learning healthy ways to cope with it. And also understanding that that feeling is okay. So I think teaching bullies, sorry, not teaching bullies, teaching victims of bullying, how to deal with those bullies is gonna be huge put some of that burden on them I mean yeah they're victims but once they become the aggressor they're no longer the victim anymore we need to stop them from getting to that point we need to work on kids to teach them not to be bullies which I think we've done a really good job about making awareness of bullying having zero tolerance for bullying I think the schools are doing a good job of that as much as they realistically can the other side of it is teach these kids who have been bullied how to process it I think the other side of that is that I also have to make sure that Nate's not going to be someone who loses his temper and decides that shooting up a school is okay. I think the more we talk about how it's the bully's fault that these kids do this, it's almost like it makes it like, okay, like that's the reasonable reaction. Someone's bullying me, so I bring a gun into school and shoot up the place. We're at the point where that actually feels normal because it happens so often and the narrative tells us that's what happened It's like this kid does this horrible thing because he was bullied. It's like, oh, I'm bullied. I'll do that, too That's not the best way to think but kids don't always think in the best ways And if that's what they've been hearing their entire lives 
That's not what I heard my entire life. I didn't start hearing that until I was an adult. If I was hearing that from kindergarten on, then that's very normal to me. That's, that's, that's what you do, apparently. And so I think we need to change that narrative. But we also need to get away from, it could never happen, it's not my kid. You don't know that. You don't know what your kid, your kid may very well be an asshole. He probably is, because most kids are. So don't take it for granted that your kid would never do it. Pay attention to your kids. Teach them to not be bullies. Make sure they do not have access to weapons. Figure out where they are mentally, because they, kids are bullying for different reasons. Happy, healthy, stable kids don't bully. Figure that out. Figure out what's what's wrong. Talk to them. Find out if something is wrong. Because while I'm talking about Nate being bullied, bullied, he has in the past also been a bully. He's been on both sides of it. So I think that's that's two two things that really need to happen. Now, the, the other things are kind of a bit more external. That's more internal work. You know, things that we can do in our home with ourselves to make sure that Nate doesn't become someone who thinks that it's okay to go and shoot up a school. And even if he does think it's okay, he doesn't have access to my firearms to be able to do it. So that's firearm safety for him, safety training for him, talking about, you know, the dangers of guns and all that and how inappropriate this is. That's not a, a healthy way of dealing with his anger, teaching him how to deal with bullies. He does Muay Thai and wrestling and things like that. He's learning how to defend himself so that he can be confident. So he's a hard target. So he's getting more muscular. He's getting bigger. He's getting more confident in himself. He does know how to defend himself. He's getting a much, much better at it. And so um, his chances of being bullied are lessened. He does not seem to be getting bullied anymore because um, after the boy stabbed him with a knife, a plastic knife from the cafeteria, but was still stabbing with a knife, and he threw an apple at him, hit him in the face. Um, I told Nate, if this boy hits you again or does anything again because the teachers weren't doing anything about it, then use your Muay Thai. People aren't allowed to hit you. They're not allowed to hurt you or touch you inappropriately if you don't want them to. Use your Muay Thai, fight back. And, you know, he kind of looked at me like I was crazy. He's like, I, I can't. I can, I can do that. I was like, yes, do it. <laughs> do it. <laughs> and oddly enough, this boy, the next day or a couple days later, hit Nate. And um, Nate beat his ass. <laughs> he punched him three or four or five, six times or whatever. And um, the principal called me up complaining. And I told him, you know, well, because he didn't know about the other stuff. And I told him, you know, this kid's been bullying him. He did this, the apple, the knife, the names, blah, blah, blah. This boy hit Nate first. And the man didn't, he didn't disagree with me. He's like, you know, he's like, well, you know, this boy, he only hit Nate once. And Nate hit him six, seven times. I'm like, okay. <laughs> well, that's a riskier run. You start a fight. Don't start none, won't be none, <laughs> you know. And there's been no bullying since. I don't advocate for violence. Quite the contrary. We've had many talks with Nate about how to deal with these bullies in de-escalating, using his words, walk away, ignore. And I'm not ignorant. I know I got bullied a lot when I was a kid because I was weird. I still am. But I know walking away or saying, hey, bully, that's not nice. You're being mean. That doesn't work. That doesn't work most of the time. But when you are out in public and if someone is being an aggressor, you do have an obligation to try to remove yourself from the danger first, to avoid the danger, to de-escalate. De if somebody comes and starts, you know, saying mean things to you, you can't just reach straight for the gun and shoot them in the face. You've got to try to de-escalate first. When that doesn't work, then you can use violence. And to me, that's really the whole point. <laughs> It's like, ideally, yeah, if Nate can say, you're being rude, I don't like the way you're talking to me, and stop. And the person actually stopped, fantastic. We're done. Excellent. Realistically, mm, probably won't work. But I want him to try. Try to de-escalate first. Try to remove yourself first. And if that doesn't work, then you bring out the guns. Let him do with the, let your hands do the talking at that point. And I'm fine with that, as long as he makes the effort first. So learning how to deal with bullies, learning to not be a bully, 
working on our mental health so that we're stable and can make good choices and understand our feelings and all that. I think those are all really important. Additionally, first aid. The reality is we live in this world where violence, gun violence in particular, is extremely common, at least in the United States. I don't know about other countries, but at least in the United States, at least in Metro Detroit, gun violence is really common. There is a very good chance that at some point, somebody's going to shoot at one of us. Having a first aid kit, specifically one with a tourniquet, with combat gauze, um, maybe some chest seals, that can be the difference between life and death. Nate carries a tourniquet in his backpack. I have multiple first aids, first aid kits either in the house, in the car, in our hiking bags, or my bike backpack. Um, I have an ankle rig kit that I haven't been carrying that much lately, like over summer with shorts and sandals. It's, uh, I got lazy, but now that I'm back to pants and, and such, I probably will start carrying it again. I definitely should. And I got to figure out a system in the summer too, because things can happen in summer as well. Um, and knowing how to use those things. We've taken multiple stop the bleed classes, uh, multiple first aid classes. There's tons of videos online and online courses that you can take to learn how to do this stuff. It's a fairly small investment in time. I've never paid for a stop the bleed class. I think you can pay for them, but there have been enough opportunities to take free ones that I never have, never had to. And we've taken it many times. Try to do it at least once a year, a couple times a year even. Since COVID, I haven't because everything is crazy, but um, hopefully we can get back to that soon enough. Um, and the, I think last, so I, I think that's four, is that five? I'm not really sure, is learning what to do in an active shooter scenario. Uh, we took a really good class or a course with, it was a, it was a joint production by the Detroit Police Department and the Fire Department. The, they split it in kind of into two parts. The per first part was active shooter scenario. What is it? What are the signs of it? What does active shooter actually mean? How do you respond? All of that fun stuff. I don't know if fun's the right word, but all of that stuff. Then the second half was a stop be bleed course with the fire department. And so this was an amazing course. I absolutely loved it. It was super informative, very hands-on, got to ask lots of questions. And if look for something like that if that is available in your area um take it it's it's well worth the effort and it was free uh, there are also programs i think it's called alice there's a lot of stuff online that you can look at i found one video in particular that i will link to at the bottom i normally say that and then i never link this time i'm actually going to do it because i think it's a really good video and very important and he talks about what to do if you find yourself in that situation. And so me and Nate had a conversation about it. We watched this video. We talked about what are you going to do, talking about his specific building, like where are places where you can hide, uh, where are places that you can run to? Are there things that you can use as a weapon? We talked about, I mean, like I said, Nate's, he's learning how to fight. He's learning how to defend himself. He's becoming a strong young man. There's a very good chance that, um, and he's in eighth grade now, so he's, you know, older and bigger than majority of the kids in the school. If somebody did come in with a gun and start shooting and he couldn't run and he couldn't hide, he, he could fight. He could go for that gun and fight. And we talked about what that would look like and what strategies he would use and what to do if he got that gun from the person. Um, and all that stuff, I think, is really important. It's really sad that we have to have that conversation. But just because it's sad doesn't mean that we shouldn't have the conversation. This is the reality that we are living in. And we we can't just, oh, kids aren't, that's, like, mm. this is our reality. This is what we have. And if having this scary conversation can help him in an even scarier situation, then I'm going to have that conversation. And he was pretty receptive of it. He knows the risk. He really didn't want to have the conversation, to be honest. Um, I can tell that he is stressed out by this and he doesn't want to think about it. But unfortunately, we don't have a choice. This is a kid who's in his class. And who knows what other kids are thinking it but not saying it. And he's going to be in high school next year. He's going to go to a different school seems like this thing's happened more in high schools and 
he's going to have to deal with this. Like I said, it's not going away. And so while I didn't push him too hard on it, we did talk about it. We will talk about it more in the future. We are working with his therapist, you know, how to process everything that's happened. Carrying his first aid kit, we reviewed tourniquets and um, stop the bleed stuff. And that's really all we can do. Until humans change, until the government figures out something, this is what we're left with. And so I just have to try to make the best of it and do the best that I can and prepare him as best I can, prepare myself as best as I can for what may happen one day. It's sad. It should not be. This should not... Things should not be this way. For human beings to be as intelligent as we are, to have the resources that we have, for civilization to come this far, going to school should not be dangerous. But it is. <laughs> so, this channel is called Ready to Die Fighting. And uh, that name came about, you know, kind of as a joke. Because it's like, well, you know, the zombies are coming. They're probably going to kill us all and we'll die. But at least we'll die fighting. <laughs> you know, that was kind of the joke. But um, that is, that's where we're at. I mean, a kid may very well one day come to Nate's school um, and, you know, shoot up the place. If that's how he's going to die, I don't want him to die not knowing what to do. I don't want him to die because he did something stupid. He, he you know, tried to hide under a desk or didn't know what to do. I want him to have a fighting chance. I want him to fight for every, every last minute of his life that he can get. And ideally come out of it alive. And then we'll deal with whatever trauma afterwards because we have therapy, we have resources. We'll, we'll, we can work through that. We can work through the aftermath, but you got to get to it. And so that's, that's the plan. All right. This is a tough talk. This is a tough topic. I don't like talking about this. I also didn't want this video. Tr I've shot this video a couple times. I didn't want it to be this long, but there's a lot to say and I, I just can't shorten it. <laughs> I've tried a few times to figure out how to shorten this video and I, it doesn't really work. There's just a lot to it. Um, so thanks for watching. If you stuck around all this time, like and subscribe. Um, stay safe. Let me know what you're doing in the comments to um, help your kids get through this. Um, yeah, I'm sad for all the people who have been directly affected by all this stuff. And, uh, I mean, I don't know. We got to figure out a way to get through it. All right. Catch you in the next video.